uh, here we're, we're on page 810, which we're going to run through. We're going to run through pretty quickly because I really, I really want to get to the, the, end, the end of the Pasha. It's got some very, very fundamental dimensions in it. Right but to the very top of the page, yeah? Well, actually, the, ch chapter 15. Um, what, what have we got? We spoke about this yesterday. We, we've got some mitzvahs that are being given to the Jewish people. One is the libation offerings, which is the wine offerings that were brought to the <coughs> temple and they were offered on the, on the um, what you call it, on the altar. Yes. And the other one is something called challah. Now challah, not to be mistaken, I mentioned yesterday, challah, not to be mistaken with the challah that we eat on Shabbos. That's not what it's referring to. It's referring to a certain amount of dough. When you make a batch of dough and you want to bake, uh, a certain small amount of that dough has to be removed in order to allow the dough to be sanctified. Right? That dough that's being removed cannot be used. Um, in the olden days it was given over to the Kohanim, but because we don't do that nowadays, so it's something which is normally burnt up. Right? You put it into the oven. Why can't you give it to people? Because, because it's something which is designated specifically for the Kohanim, giving it to the poor people, will not. you won't be able to fulfill the obligation. In the, quite the opposite, it will cause them to eat food that they're not supposed to be eating. Is this what's referred to as a burnt offering? When they're burning, yeah? No. In the olden days, right, when the temple was extant, so it was given, it wasn't burnt, it was given to a coin. Oh, okay. And he, he used it. He could bake it and he could turn it into whatever he wanted. Okay. It, nowadays, when we don't, we don't do those things anymore, so what do you do with it? Now it gets burnt. Um, interestingly enough, what you know... So it's interesting, right? What about Baltashkis wasting food which is considered to be a prohibition. You're not supposed to waste food. However, over here, we're being taught that because this piece of dough has got so much sanctity, yeah, that right. there's, not, there's nothing that can be done with it, which means even though under normal circumstances you're not allowed to waste any food, over here, you are. And uh, what's interesting is, you know, you've got, you've got some pretty big bakeries over here in Israel, for example, Angels and Burmans, who are producing the most enormous amount of dough every day, and uh, one of the things that the mashkichim, that the, that the uh, people who are overlooking the kashras over there, one of the things that they have to do continuously is to be taking challah, right? They'll take challah several times a day because, like I said, you know, enormous amounts of dough are being made and each batch now has to, uh, you know, has to have its separate challah taken from it. Do you think they, um, they uh, are observant to that rule? Yeah, yeah. All, all, of the, all of the bakeries over here that have some kind of rabbinic supervision, regardless of where it's coming from, are going to, are going to have the challah taken off at source. Oh, they take it away. Yeah, yeah, which means that you don't, you don't have anything to worry about. You can go into a bakery and you can buy whatever you want to buy. You don't have to be concerned about the fact that it was taken, it wasn't taken. Based in regulated all properly, properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No matter who the is. Yeah, right. Even 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 uh, you know even regular hashgacha, which some people would prefer not to use, they prefer to use well, you know more stringent hashgachas. Yeah, but they're, they're also you have high kosher and regular kosher, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. And, but nevertheless, everybody's taking khala. It's being done, and it's being done at source, and it's uh, you know it's a, it's a fantastic thing. It really is. Of course, of course. It makes some sure places in the it. shuk, very few, two places that say you know. We took out the... Uh, like all the other ones don't say anything. So again, it depends. I, you know, it, it really depends on where they are and who's giving the hashkocha over there. Right? But you can ask them. Ask them what's going on. Now, I'll ask you a very brief question, Rabbi. That, that deviates from your slide. I'll ask you a brief question. See, when you make bracha over something once, you have to say it with every glass. Or once no. You it. No. When you're talking about liquid, <coughs> so as long as you're drinking <coughs> within a half an hour after having made the bracha. So you make a bracha and you have a drink, right. and then you just leave it, you know. You, but if you're going to drink again within a half an hour, then you, don't, you can just keep going. The Yemen says you can keep going all day. I, mean, I was glad I've had that, um, had that point emphasized by a reliable source, because really, I've asked lots of people and they say different things. Right. So you can, you, can, uh, you know, so long as you're taking a sip once every, at least once every half an hour, the then it's okay. Sense. If... Half an hour, if half an hour plus has you know yeah. elapsed, then you should uh, have to you have to make another bracha. With uh, food, right, so if you're talking about uh, mizonot, yeah. right, mizonot, so then you've got 45 minutes, right, within 45 minutes, In and with bread, liquid, huh? Liquid is half an hour. Mizonot is 72 minutes. Uh, sorry, is is 45 minutes, and bread is 72 minutes. 
which means you're sitting at a, you're sitting at a suda on Friday night, you know, and it's, you're having a fantastic time. There's lots of singing, lots of different Torah, but you know, you, you, you haven't been eating very much. So long as you just have a little, a little piece of something to keep you going, then you've just extended your, your ability to bench for another 72 minutes. Okay, something to keep an eye on. Um, so what was it again? Bread was 72? Bread is 72 minutes. Yeah. Mazonot, which is cake and biscuits and pasta and crackers and that kind of stuff, is 45 minutes. Yeah. And, and other, everything else is, is, uh, is half an hour. Does yeah. matzah come under mazonot? No, matzah, matzah is, uh, yeah. is hamotzi, yeah. So here, let, let's, I want to skip over. Let, let's, let's jump ahead. We're going to go to page 816 which is coming towards the end of the Pasha. And we've got a very, very troubling little thing that takes place over here. And it says right at the top, that on Shabbos itself, a fellow was found collecting sticks. It's not 100% sure exactly what he was doing. Maybe he was collecting sticks. Maybe he was, maybe he was breaking off the sticks, whatever it is. On Shabbos. And what happened? He's brought to Moshe and to Aaron because he's been desecrating the Shabbos. Yes. And they put him into, they lock, they lock him up because they don't know what to do with him. Right? Moshe is not 100% sure. They know that he's supposed to get the death penalty. They're just not sure you know, there are four different levels of death penalty. They're not sure which one he's supposed oh, to so get. Breaking the Shabbos in, it was um, liable with death penalty. Again, it, it, you know what? Yes, but let me, let me clarify that in a moment, okay? He's going to be stoned to death. The Kodesh Baruch Hu says he's going to be stoned to death. That's the way it's going to be. And he's taken out and he's stoned to death. Right, in the way that God commanded Moshe. Now, you have to understand something. Anything that has a capital punishment to it inside of Jewish law, first of all, nowadays it's not applicable. Right? It's still halakhli, um, um, law, is it still law, halakhli? Is there, is there, well, again, there, there, the law is still on the books, that's for sure. Right? It's something which can't be enforced. Right? It requires a Sanhedrin, it requires, being, uh, it, it requires a very, very specific setup in order for it to be able to happen. On top of that, it requires two witnesses coming to the person and telling them that you know that if you do what you're doing, you're transgressing punishment. this mitzvah, you, it's a capital punishment, and you'll be killed with this punishment, with this particular execution, right? And that both of, them, both of them have to give testimony that that's what happened, and if they both give testimony that that's what happened, then he'll be put to death, and if not, then he won't. You can't put him to death. Right? <laughs> don't worry, right? Hashem. Emit Hashem. You know, when the time comes when all of these mitzvahs are put back into place again, the Mashiach will be here. We'll all be keeping what we're supposed to keep. There's an Indian. It's something very fascinating. It really is. The way that this has been set up is in order to try to avoid the possibility of people being put to death by mistake. Which means one aid, one, one witness. Well, it's perfectly conceivable that one witness could have made a mistake somewhere. Right? Maybe he didn't say exactly what he was supposed to say. Maybe he didn't see exactly what he was supposed to see. If there's no corroborating evidence, then the, the testimony of that one person is not accepted. Right? The base thing can't do anything with it, and they can't put the person to death. The only way that it can be done is when you've got these two people, they're interrogated in the base thing, in the Sanhedrin, they interrogate them to make sure that it's a, it's a very, very intensive interrogation to make sure they're both saying the same thing and that they're both is saying the truth, and then if the final result is that what they're saying is correct, then the person is taken out and put to death. If they find out, if they found out to be falsifying the testimony, are they put to death? Yeah. There's a, there's a concept called Edim Zomimim. There is, a, again, there's a, a detail over here which is really quite fascinating. The Edim Zomimim are, the Edim come and they testify something which is not true in order to, whatever, in order to get this fellow into trouble. Whatever they were trying, if it's found out that they are false witnesses, if, it, if it's done before the, before the sentence was passed, then whatever they wanted to do is done to them. 
which was that if they're coming along and they're, they say that he stole something in order to make him pay something back, which is a monetary issue, then they would have to pay whatever it was the other fellow was being oh, accused of. So whatever they do, I'm right to lead to the other fellow, if it's deemed to be false and the punishment's passed. Yes. Legal, yes. Legal, if legal, they legal. wanted to put, have him put to death, legal, legal, legal. then they would be put to death. Midah, connected Midah, right? The only thing is, though, what makes this fascinating is that the halacha is only applicable before the sentence was passed. If the sentence has already been passed, then at that point, the people, the Aiden Zomimim, are not punished with whatever it was that they were supposed to be punished with. The Gemara says that it seems that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted that person to be punished. Right, right, yeah. And this is the way that it was done. It doesn't mean that those two are off the hook, right? They're going to have to account what for what they've what done. The... One last thing over here, which is something, again, all, all of this stuff is very fascinating. Yeah, the concept of, of uh, the based in and capital punishments, that the way that the, the witnesses were... The, the way that the witnesses were interrogated was so intense that it was very, very rare that they would ever find somebody guilty of a capital punishment. There's a very right. intense... If, if, there, if there is any kind of discrepancy between what they're saying, yeah. even if it's a natural discrepancy, which means one person says that he was wearing a yellow shirt and the other one said it was green, yeah, right? Yellow or green are pretty yeah. similar to each other, right? Nevertheless... The, uh, then the, uh, the, case is, the case is thrown out. So it has to be watertight, that shallow without... Absol shallow absolutely. A absolutely, right? Absolutely. And it says, interestingly enough, that a court that executes somebody once every seven years, or even according to one opinion, once every 70 years, is considered to be a murderous based in. Right. A bloodthirsty based in. You know that's saying? That yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, right? Which means that there is, there is no that there is no real vested interest in wanting to put people yes, to death. Yes. Right? If there's no other alternative, that's what they'll do. So here, what have we got over here? Over here, what's for sure is that this person was met whilst he was doing what he was doing. He was seen by two witnesses. Yeah, the witnesses come and they tell him that, there's you know, you're transgressing Shabbos and if you do, and the person's got to say, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway and go ahead and do it immediately. He doesn't wait, right? He does it straight away. And then he gets brought to base. And over here, the question was, what kind of death penalty yeah. is he supposed to have? So they have to wait in order for Moshe Rabbeinu to be able to hear from God what's the what right thing the to do. Uh, what are there, is, there is stoning, there is beheading, there is um, pour, pouring, pouring hot lead down a person's throat, and there is, right, there is hanging. Now, all of these are actually, even though they sound rather nasty, they're, they're all very, very quick. And uh, interestingly enough, before the person is actually taken out to be put to death, he's given something to drink, some kind of a, whether it's alcohol or whether it's got some kind of a drug inside of it, so he's really not aware of what's going on, to make it as painless as possible. As humane as possible. Yeah, so absolutely. Like cheer, they give something Whatever, them. yeah, same kind of an idea. Um, what, what is... Who, who is this fellow? This Makoshesh Eitzin, this fellow who was collecting up the sticks. Who is he? He's a fellow that should have kept Shabbos. He's a fellow who could have, should have kept Shabbos. Rabbi Akiva in the Gemara has a fascinating insight who, into who this fellow must have been. Yes. Later on, towards the end of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, just before the Jewish people are going into the land of Israel, there's a very interesting moment when five daughters come to Moshe Rabbeinu and they say like this, daughters. Five sisters come to Moshe Rabbeinu and they say like this, our father died in the desert. He wasn't involved in the uprising and the rebellion of Korach. He died for his own sin. And we want to know whether we're going to receive his inheritance from the land of Israel or whether you're going to give it out to other people. So it's one of the things that Moshe has to go and wait to hear from God what's supposed to happen. In the end, they receive what they're supposed to receive. I thought someone else, another Rabbi Hamza, said, halakhli, girls are not allowed to get inheritance. Girls, according to Halacha, girls don't inherit, but only when there are boys. Okay. There were only five daughters over here. There was no sons, which no, means... The, the daughters of... Uh, they, they complained that they were daughters. They, oh, so here, who were they? They were the daughters of somebody called Slavchad. Right. So right? Slavchad, so Rabbi Akiva says, hold on, let's make, an, let's, make a, let's make a calculation over here, right? If this fellow died in the desert, and he didn't die because of any kind of national problem, which means he didn't die because he was involved in the, uh, he was involved in the, the, in the uh, not, not the eagle, in the, in the, uh, the spies. 
And he didn't die because he was involved in the rebellion of Korach. Where's the rebellion of Korach? We're going to come to it next oh, week. Okay. Emet Hashem, okay. right? Mm-hmm. You'll, have to, you'll have to wait for that one, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, so if he didn't die for that, and he didn't, fi- he didn't die for that, then how did he die? People didn't die for no reason in the desert. And it says that they say that he died for his own sin. So Rabbi Akiva comes along and he says, why did he die? He died in order, he died because he was the Makoshesh Eitzin. He was the one always collecting the wood. And then he explains Rabbi Akiva the most incredible thing. He says, why did he do what he did? It's a, it says, Tzlovchod is kaveh l'shem shemayim. He did it for the right reasons. Hi, what could be the right reasons for transgressing the Shabbos? So he says he saw by the Jewish people that people were not beginning to take Shabbos observance very seriously. So he deliberately went out and did something which was going to bring the death penalty upon himself in order to show everybody just how serious keeping Shabbos really is. The question is, did he do the right thing or he didn't do the right thing? So explain the Mephoshim, he didn't, even though he did it for the right reasons, he should never have done what he did. Which means you can't sin. It's an enormous sin what he did over here, right? You can't sin in order to show everybody how serious it is to sin. But his sin is probably pre- must have prevented hundreds of thousands of people in that time in the Jewish. Community. I don't know. Here, listen, listen to this. There's, a, there's another possible. You, one thing of what you're saying is maybe it's true, right? Which means that in order to reinforce to the Jewish people just how serious Shabbos is, so he did what he did, and he stopped. Straight away, he stopped all the people's, you know, leniences and, and not being stringent with Shabbos observance. Stopped it straight away. The other alternative explains some of them are Foshim, that if the Jewish people would have kept this Shabbos, this was the second Shabbos that they were in the Midbar, in the, in the desert, if they would have kept this Shabbos, then everything would have changed. If the Jewish people keep two Shabboses in a row, then we're talking about an enormous difference in what's going to be. According to one opinion, the Mashiach is going to come. But whatever it means is that we're still paying the, the uh, you know, that we're still paying the price of his having done what he did, even though he did it. L'shem Shemaim, he did it for the right reasons. So I don't know, we're, we're not judging over here, right? I don't know, he did the right thing, he didn't do the right thing. It's clear according to the rabbis that he shouldn't have done what he did. But what's also clear from what the rabbis are saying is that his kavana, his intent, was 100% good. How does this translate? So I saw, it's an interesting, I saw something very interesting, and then I said in the name of the Chido, one of the, one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the later Sfadi rabbis, there's an interesting little story in the Gemara. The Gemara says there was once a fellow who walked out onto his, walking around his fields on Shabbos, and he saw that the fence, he had a wooden fence that went around his fields to demarcate what belonged to him, and he saw that there was a hole you don't want holes, right? You've got a hole in your, in, your, uh, in your fence. It means people can come in and they can take your produce. And he says to himself, you know what? I'm going to have to uh, fix that. After Shabbos, I'm going to have to fix that. And then he thinks to himself, whoa, I'm not allowed to think about these things on Shabbos. Think no, it. on Shabbos, you're supposed to be dedicated to it's thinking Shabbos. spiritual ideas and remaining in time the realms of Shabbos, not to think about business things and what's going to be after Shabbos. So he says, you know what I'm going to do? I am deliberately not going to fix that hole yeah. after Shabbos. I'm going to leave it because I should never have thought about what I thought. Wow. Says, listen to this though, says the Kabara, that overnight a bush grew where that hole was. Right? As if God was, was you know, giving him a reward, he, a bush grew something called a tzlaf. A tzlaf, I don't know what kind of bush it is exactly, but it's like a, like a, like a wild bush, right? And it filled up the hole and everything was taken care of. Says the Chida, very beautiful idea. He says that this fellow who was looking at his, at his fence and thinking to himself that he needs to fix it on Shabbos, so this fellow, what happens? He said, this is a Gilgal, this is a reincarnation of Tzlovchad, of this, this person over here. Because he transgressed the Shabbos, even though he did it for the right reasons, so now he's given the opportunity to come out and not to transgress Shabbos for the right reasons, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu then repaid him for what he did. Says the Chidah, how does he know? Because he says that the name of the person over here, according to Rabbi Akiva, was somebody called Slavchad. And the bush that grew was a Tzlaf. And only one bush grew. And Tzlafchad, one bush. And Tzlafchad, the name of this person, are the same thing. So says the Chidah that 
it must be some kind of a Gilgal, some kind of reincarnation of this Neshama that's got to come down now and it's got to make some kind of a rectification for whatever it did. Good. What happens next? So let's take a look. We're going to take a look at the last piece of the, of the, uh, of the Pasha. This week is something that Amir Tashem will all be familiar with. What we've got to try to work out is, how does it fit in? There's something called smichut, which means that we don't, it's not random. Things move from one part, one portion into the next portion. There's got to be some kind of a connector somewhere, something that's going to allow us to make the transition from this, into this story into that story. So before we look at the transition, let's have a look and see what we've got. Here, verse number 37. Hashem Moshe lemos. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe, Dabel b'nei Yisov v'amat alem v'asulem tzitzis al kanthei v'gdehem l'doyo Yisom. You have to make tzitzis. V'nosnu ala tzitzis ha'kanaf p'sul t'cheles. And on your tzitzis, you're supposed to have a blue thread. V'yalechem le tzitzis u'reisem o'isoi. And you should have them, your tzitzis, and you should see them. Uzchatim is called mitzvot Hashem v'asisem o'isom. And you'll remember, you look at your tzitzis, You'll remember the mitzvahs and you'll keep them. And don't allow yourself to go after your heart and after your eyes. And then you're going to stray. Why? In order for you to keep my mitzvahs. And you're going to be holy. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt, and I'm the Lord your God. Pretty familiar stuff, right? Anybody who recites the Shema, you'll know this is the third paragraph of the Shema over here, right? So we, we need to try to understand, of course, we, that the mitzvah of wearing tzitzis has to be put in somewhere. The mitzvah of wearing tzitzis has to be something that we're familiar with, otherwise, you know, the Torah has to give it to us somewhere, but why over here? Right? It seems to be a little bit of a non sequitur. We're going from the story of Tzlofchad, and, the, uh, and, and breaking Shabbos, and all of a sudden we're going into the story of the, of the tzitzis instead. Let's have a look and see. So before we go any further, let's try to understand what is the function of tzitzis. So we see over here it's very clear that the whole idea of weighing tzitzis is what? That you should see them, and you should do the mitzvahs. Say again? Oh, tzitzis is a wonderful mitzvah. It really is. Because the whole time that you're wearing tzitzis, you don't get one mitzvah for putting on your tzitzis in the morning and then taking them off when you go to bed. But the whole time that you're wearing tzitzis, you're getting, you're accumulating mitzvahs. Right? The mitzvahs are snowballing. It's just growing and growing and growing. And the whole time that you've got it, the whole time you're wearing it, you're getting the mitzvah. There's a, of course, it comes with a little bit of a, a condition over. You've got to be aware of the fact that you're wearing them. It says, or so you've got to see them. You know what? Seeing is not necessarily physically, although many people have the custom to wear their tzitzis out, mm -hmm. but seeing is a state of mind. You've got to be aware of the fact that you're wearing them. Right? So let's have a look and see what we've got over here because there's something very, 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 something very special about tzitzis. The Gemara says that the wearing tzitzis is something which brings us back to God, right? It reminds us of what, we, what it is that we're supposed to be doing. How does it work, right? So it works in all different kinds of ways. I think we've spoken about this in the past, but uh, the idea of the color, you've got the blue thread. We'll talk about the blue thread in a minute, right? But you've got the blue thread, and the blue thread reminds you of, this, of the sea, and the sea reminds you of the sky, and the sky reminds you of sapphire, and God's throne is made out of sapphire, and then you remember God, right? Which means that wearing your tzitzis is something which is going to stop you from sinning. When a person's overwhelmed with the desire to sin, he looks at his tzitzis and he says to himself, Oh, tzitzis, hold on. Blue, sea, sky, sapphire, throne, God. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I have no blue on my tzitzis. We'll get to the blue in a minute. We'll talk, we'll talk about it. Right? I, I've, got a, I've got a more fundamental question. Right, you're concerned about not having any blue, which means but a person's overwhelmed with the desire to sin, and he'll look at his tzitzis, and he won't see any blue, and he'll say, oh, well, I guess it's okay. Right? But the, uh, I, I've got a more fundamental question over here, which is, what, what, what on earth does that mean? That, that's bizarre, isn't it? Somebody's overwhelmed with the desire to sin, and what has he got to do? He's got to start making word association. So blue, blue thread, 
sea, sky, sapphire, throne, God. Why don't we just say, look at your titus and think of God? But I think that's what it is. Really. No, so the shot is like this. That's what we're. That's what it's supposed to be, right? Yeah. But what happens when we're overwhelmed with sin, with, with the desire to sin? We're not focusing on God anymore. Yes. You're not going to jump from your titus to God. It's got to be done in a very subtle way. It's got to be done in a quiet way. Oh, blue. Hold on a second. The sea, the sea is blue. That's not threatening. That's not going to stop me from not sinning, right? But the sea will bring me to the sky, and the sky will bring me to the sapphire, and the sapphire will bring me to the throne of God, and God will bring me to the point where I'm not supposed to be sinning, so which means... Oh, bit by bit, right? Yes, bit by yes, bit. Yes. You've got to... You, you can't... When a person's overwhelmed with the desire to sin, you can't just stop like that. Well, you know what? Some people can. Most people can't, right? So you've got to take it easy. And really what the sages are teaching us, there's another Chazal, Chazal say that if you take the gematria of tzitzit, that's 600. And if you add the eight threads that you have on each corner, that's 608. And the five knots is 613. So if you're going to sin, you've got to quickly work out what the gematria of tzitzit is. And then you've got to quickly add on another eight, another five, and you'll get to 613. And then you won't sin. What, what's pshat? What are we learning of? It's something absolutely incredible. Judaism is the most realistic religion in the world. I always say this. Always. What makes it so realistic? God knows perfectly well that people have a tendency to want to sin. Right? We're human. And we're, we're pulled by our physical desires. How does one get a handle on that? In other religions, a person who sins is a sinner and he's, you know, he's, 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 uh, he's terrible. And, and, uh, and uh, when you're overwhelmed with the desire to sin, you've got to stop that desire immediately and... It doesn't work like that. For not Catholicism, they sin as much as they want. Go to the booth and pay the, pay the priest money. Yeah, so it's all, and it's all, it's very superficial, right? It's, three Hail Marys and that's it. It's all very superficial, but you understand over here what, what the sages are saying is like, this is the most fantastic thing, right? We, 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 of course we have desires to do things we're not supposed to do. So how do we get a handle on that? How, do we, how can we overcome that? What the sages are saying is stop and think. Stop and think. Do I, do I really need to be doing this, right? So slowly but surely you put the brakes on. If you brake suddenly, you know, who knows what's going to happen. You'll go, flying through, you'll go flying through the windshield, right? But if you, if you slow down, you brake slowly, then you'll come to a standstill and it's, you won't even feel that you've come to a standstill. I remember when I, when I was learning how to drive, the driving instructor used to say that when you come to a standstill, when you brake, if you, if you don't, if there's no sort of jerk at the end. There's no like shudder at the end that means that you break properly you didn't even feel it you just slowed down and stopped that's what we're being taught over here what we're being taught over here is that a person's got to be constantly aware of the fact that god wants him to do god's will here in this world if we're constantly aware of that fact then what will be we'll be able to overcome the desires to not do what god wants us to do not that they'll never be there Judaism is more realistic than that. We'll always have those desires. They'll always be lurking around inside of us, which means that we have to have our tzitzis and we wear them out in order to see them, in order to have a constant tool to be able to help us overcome what's going on. On top of our bad desires. Oh, if you will. So here, why is this coming after Tzlovchad, after the person who was collecting the wood? Because now the answer is simple, no? If he, would have had <laughs> if he would have been aware of what God really wanted him to do, then there's no way that he would have been able to do what he did, right? It's as simple as that. But because he wasn't aware of that, he was so caught up in what he wanted to do that he ended up doing something that he shouldn't have done. So long come the tzitzit to teach us. But there's more. Here, if you drop down... No, no, drop down to verse number 39. <laughs> And then it says, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be, you know, go off in the direction. Say the Mephoshim, say the commentary is the most incredible thing over here. The words, is the same word that was used for the, the uh, Meraglim, the spies. It says they went to go, and, to, to, go around the, to go around the land. Which means that the, what was the problem with the spies? 
The problem with the spies was that they weren't looking at their titties, right? If they would have been looking at their titties, there's no way that they would have been able to do what they did. What were they looking at? They were looking at themselves. Veloisa surah, that's not what we're here to do. So let's have a look and see. Somebody, somebody should have latched onto this, and the fact that you didn't obviously reflects very poorly upon you, as I'm sure you all realize. Right at the end of verse number 39, what does it say? That you shouldn't go after what? After your heart and after your eyes? In order to go and do what you want to do. Huh? No, Rabbi Sai. Huh? Something's wrong here, no? When a person desires something, where does the desire begin? Right? With your eyes. You see something that you want, and then all of a sudden, it's like, you know, I've got, I've got to have that thing. And yet, what does the Torah say? The Torah says, That don't go after your heart and after your eyes. Huh? You, you hear the problem? Yeah, Sometimes when you desire something badly, you build up so much, it becomes a mishigar, it's like you can't stop thinking about it. Oh, so what's the pshat? The pshat is like this. That, uh, that, uh, that, that a person, it's not that a person sees something and then wants it. What we're learning over here is something much, much deeper than that. Is that a person wants it, and then he sees what he wants. You hear the idea? It's working the other way around. A person, a person has a desire, an inner desire inside of him, and then he'll start looking around trying to find that thing that's going to match up what he desires. That's like what I said at first. I think that it starts in your head. Right? The, the one oh, so here, the, the, the Torah is using the words of the, the heart, right. right, as opposed to the head. The because eyes. the heart, it's the seat of your emotions. In the eyes. Right? And then the eyes, which means that the eyes are going to be used, <laughs> right, in order to be able to bring them, to bring them back, right? Here, look what, here what, here, look what Rashi says. Alev ve'enayim hei maraglim laguf. Unbelievable, right? We just spoke about the thing with the spies, yeah? Rashi uses those words. The heart and the eyes are the spies of the body. <laughs> they, they check out the Averas for them. They're, they're the ones that are, that are working towards having these sins put into place. The eye sees, the heart desires, and the body does the Avera. There's a partnership going on over here. Right? But it's, not, it's not that a person's body is just, you know, reacting and that's all there is to it. But rather your eyes and your heart and your body are all coming together in partnership in order to go against what God wants you to do. And you've got to try and overcome because I think your Nashum is your spirit, yeah? Yeah. It's always got a little bias in your head. And when you want to do bad, telling you like, that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah, so which means that the Yemen is like this, that when a person sins, they are going against... What they really want to do. You've got to have a. You, you, you've got to, Yeah, yeah. You've got to have a. There's <laughs> got to be a lot of motivation, right, to, to to do that. And unfortunately, we're pretty motivated people. We really are, right. So very often, that's what we do. We we allow the body to overcome the soul, and we we uh, you know we disregard what the soul is telling us, and we end up doing things that we we should never do. That's why when you attain a more spiritual level, I think people tend to listen to their soul more in most situations. Oh, for sure. But, on the other hand, says the Gemara, the greater you are, the greater your Yetzirah is. Yeah. Which means the Yetzirah works according to who you are. Because the Yetzirah is spiritual as well, no? The Yetzirah is very spiritual, right? Yeah. And that means that the Yetzirah works hard over but Yetzirah works very, very hard, right? Working 24 especially, hours a day, yeah. seven days a week, that's for no, sure. Especially with a very... Oh, so what's pshat? We would say like this, right? Uh, us, from our perspective of not being great people, we would say that the greater you are, then surely the greater control you have over your Yetzirah, right? But the emphasis of Gemara says not like that. The Gemara is saying that the greater you are, the greater the Yetzirah will try to trip you up. However, when a person's not great, so the Yetzirah will trip them up with obvious simple things, Right? So a person, they'll eat, you know, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be seduced into eating a cheeseburger, right? Yeah, the or they'll be seduced into, into having a relationship they shouldn't be having. Yeah. A great person, right, a spiritual person, is never going to eat a cheeseburger. Yeah. 
A spiritual person is never going to get involved in a, in, a, in a physical relationship that's forb forbidden for him to be involved in. So the Yetzirah, what's it going to do? It's very wily, the Yetzirah. It will use different dimensions. So for a physical person, the Yetzirah will set up physical obstacles and hopefully, you know, hope that the person will not, not overcome it, right? But for a spiritual person, what does the Yetzirah do? The Yetzirah will, will use spiritual dimensions in order to try to trip them up. So for example, right, you can have somebody who is battling with whether to eat kosher or not to eat kosher, the Yetzirah is going to work in one way. You can have somebody who's like, like Rav Yashiv, who, who was learning 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day, whatever it was, something absolutely extraordinary. By, by him, the Yetzirah is not going to try to trip him up by having him eat a cheeseburger. That's not going to happen. But what the Yetzirah will try to do is the Yetzirah will try to steal his time. That, that two minutes that the Yetzirah managed to distract him with has got ramifications in the spiritual realms that are far, far greater than the fellow who's yeah, trying not to eat cheeseburgers. Do you right? think, do you, because I don't know if how true this is, I can't remember exactly, but a Jewish person once said to me, the Yetzirah, like, is God's most important angel. Yeah, for sure, are you kidding? always trying to trip you up. Rav Hirsch, Rav Hirsch says like this, first of all, you should not, don't be scared of your Yetzirah, because it's from your Yetzirah, that's how we grow. Right? How do you grow? By being tested. Because Hashem could wipe the Yetzirah out. Yeah, but but for sure. But if Hashem wipes out the Yetzirah, no then you've got no, if you've got no temptation, how on earth are you going to draw closer to God? Right. right? Which means that the only way that we can, we can know that we're growing, the only way that we can be sure that we're doing the right thing is when we come across hurdles and we come across obstacles and sometimes we'll overcome them and sometimes we won't. And you should know that overcoming the, overcoming the hurdles is good but sometimes, how's this for an incredible paradox? Sometimes, failing is the best thing that we can do as well. Because by failing, it, it, it urges you on and makes you reassess and become stronger from what happened. Which means that ultimately, the Yetzirah is, you know, it's, it's, it's great, the Yetzirah. There's a, there's a verse, King Solomon says, Shlema Melech says, Sheva Yipol Tzadik Vakam. That a Tzadik, he falls over seven times and he gets up. Rav Hutner, one of the great, one of the great philosophers of the previous generation, Rav Hutner says that fools think that the person got up because he's a tzaddik. Right? Picks himself up because he's a tzaddik. Rav Hutner says that's not what it is. He says a person becomes a tzaddik because he picks himself up. Which means we, 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 we try our hardest to do what we're supposed to do. We don't always succeed. What God wants to see from us is that after we failed, what do we do now? Are we going to work on ourselves? Are we going to draw ourselves higher? Are we going to work out that we've got to work on this particular issue over here in order to, to overcome that and then move on to the next thing? The whole world that we live in is one spiritual test after another. And don't imagine that you've got somebody who's grappling with not eating cheeseburgers. So don't imagine that once a person's overcome <coughs> that desire, then that's it. There are no yeah, more yeah. desires anymore. You, you move on one. to the next one. And the next one for sure. Change. Bit after bit after Down. bit until Down. a person can reach a moment where they started off this whole journey. They started off, you know, grappling with cheeseburgers. And by the end of their lives, they're grappling with the extra minute here or the extra minute there in order to dedicate that time to God. It's astonishing, and that, that's where it's we grow from. Reason, yeah. And from the moment that we're born, that's what we, that's what we need to be that's doing. That's what we're trying, yeah, for sure. And that's what tzitzis come along, and the tzitzis are there to, to give us a handle to help us do that. Can you still buy ones that have got blue thread on them? Oh, so it's interesting. Where did the blue thread come from? The blue thread came from something called the chilazon. The chilazon was some kind of a mollusk. Right? It's not 100% sure what it was. However, there's something called the Tchelet Institute here in Yerushalayim where they're doing a lot of research nowadays to try and find out what this, what this thing was. It was the dye, it was the blood of this mollusk that was squeezed out and it gave a certain... Blood of like a, like a snail of some kind, but a sea, a sea snail, no, a mollusk. A little bit, yeah, but it's not coming from an octopus, it's something coming from something much smaller than that. And, uh, and it was used to dye the thread. It was an was a interesting kind of color of blue. Not blue-blue, more like a turquoise. And uh, today, 
in the Tchelet Institute, they reckon that they've managed to narrow it down to two possibilities. Part of the problem was that a lot of, a lot of animals apparently secrete this kind of uh, this dye. However, when it comes into contact with sunlight, it fades. And the real Tchelet is one which doesn't fade. Right? So I think they think they've got it down to two possibilities right now. There is an absolutely fascinating little historical side note that the Admor of Rujin, before the Second World War, uh, the, Admor, the Admor Mi Rujin, uh, he thought he'd found the, the recipe, right, for making the Tcheles, right? And uh, he went around Europe trying to get the great Talmud Chachomim of the generation to give, an, you know, to give some kind of, a, a, of a, an approval for what he was saying, but they didn't agree with him. They didn't say that it was right. Um, one of the reasons was because inside of the recipe for what he had, he, uh, he added a little bit of copper sulfate. Uh, copper sulfate will turn anything blue, um, which means that it's something that had to be completely natural. Well, why is this so fascinating? The Regina Hasidim were completely wiped out, not completely, but 90% 90, 90 wiped out during the Second World War by the Nazis. They were, they were massacred. And uh, the, the Rebbe died. He was, he was uh, killed during the war. And uh, after the Second World War, when the Hasidim, they tried to reestablish themselves and they wanted to show their allegiance to the Regina Hasidus, so they wanted to wear this blue thread on their titis again. The problem was they didn't know the uh, they didn't formula. know what the recipe was, the formula, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll just dry it blue. Huh? No, but you, no, no, because you got to use it. It's got to be done according according to the halacha, right? So who did they go to? They went to somebody called Rabbi Yitzhak Isaac Herzog, who was the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, who was the chief rabbi in Ireland before he came to Israel, and had actually written his PhD thesis on Tcheles, on this blue thread, and he proved in his thesis that what the Regina Rebbe had said wasn't correct, couldn't be right. But he had the recipe, he had the formula. So the Hasidim came to him, and he gave the formula, and until today, there's a Hasidus, it's right at the very beginning of Geula, they've got a great big building, Baruch Hashem, today they've re-established themselves, and they are thriving Hasidut, but they've, they've got their blue thread on their tzitzis, which is something which is not normally found amongst other Hasidus. Why do most people not wear tcheles right now? Because the Halacha itself says that the not having the blue on the thread does not detract from the mitzvah, which means we can still fulfill the mitzvah of wearing tzitzis with white tzitzis strings, without having the blue string in there as well. I don't know. I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether it's sure. I'm, re I'm really not sure what's sure and what's not. But uh, to do it, there's certainly, there's certainly not a problem to do it. Good, okay. Hey, but uh, you said that there is a mafloke, there's two animals that they think it is. Yeah. So yeah, we've, it, we've established that this one of the recipe. It has to have one of them, right? One of one of them one or the other, the right? One. The other one I tell one. you, I tell you, actually, the, the head of this the head of this uh, institute happens to be my kid's dentist. Oh, yeah. He's a guy called Ari Greenspan. He's a uh, incredibly overqualified individual. He's absolutely brilliant. He's a dentist. He's a shoichet. He's a moil. He's he's, he's a, you name it, he can do it. And uh, <laughs> and he uh, and he uh, he also has this thing about. Tcheles. And he spent many years investigating and he spent many years trying to work out which is the right one, which is not the right one, and a lot of time and research. And uh, so he's pretty sure that he, he thinks very soon we're going to get it narrowed down to one and it's going to be one which hopefully will be accepted. But in the meantime, until it's accepted by everybody, if you want to wear them, wear them. If you don't want to wear them, don't wear them. It's yeah, fine. It's Whatever you're doing, the important it's thing, the important, oh, the important thing is to do the mitzvah, right? So there's a beautiful story which we'll end with for today. It says that the Vilna Gaon, the great Gaon from Vilna, uh, you know, a couple of hundred, 250 years ago, he was on his deathbed and he started to cry. And the, uh, his Talmudim, his students, gathered around him and they asked him, Rebbe, what are you crying about? You can imagine that the Vilna Gaon was so incredibly brilliant and uh, the idea of the Vilna Gaon going anywhere except for into the world to come after his death was inconceivable. And he grabbed a hold of his titus and he says, you know, for a few groschen pennies over here, you can, you can buy yourself olam abai. You can buy yourself the world to come, he says, but over there you can't do that. Over here in this physical world that we live in, we can, we can accrue mitzvahs and we can make our place in the world to come. And titus 
is the most incredible opportunity because, like I said before, you're not fulfilling one mitzvah when you put them on in the morning. The whole time that you're wearing your tzitzis, you're accruing more mitzvahs and more mitzvahs. Every and for a few minutes. pennies, huh? Every five minutes. Every, is that what it is? Every five minutes, whatever it is. But you understand, for a few pennies over here, there aren't many mitzvahs that you're able to, take, to get that kind of a benefit yes. from. Tzitzis are very important mitzvahs. For sure, 100%. Tzitzit is a very important mitzvah. The Gemara says the way in tzitzit is shock or connect a collar mitzvah. It weighs up against all the other mitzvahs, which was that idea that we spoke about the gematria of tzitzit being 600 plus the 8 plus the 3 is 613. The mitzvah of tzitzit is something incredibly fundamental. What makes it so incredibly important is that if we wear tzitzit properly, that is our handle on doing what Hashem wants us to do. It's not a guarantee. Everybody understands that. You can't just put on your titties and say, you know what, now I'll do whatever I want because my titties won't let me sin. It doesn't work like that. It's just a helping hand. Right? But it's, it's a, certainly a helping hand. It's something which is going to allow you to be able to overcome the desire to sin if you want to. If you use it the proper way. Right, for sure. You, you, know. Yeah, you know, I told you that we're going to end with that idea of the Vilna Khan, but you know, I just remembered another story. So we'll end, we'll end with something else instead. In, in, uh, in Europe, going back before the First World War, um, it was very difficult for Jews to get positions, right, prestigious positions inside of companies. It was very difficult. There was a non, there was, there was a Jewish, non from Jewish man who was a ma he was a manager of a bank. Now in those days, being the manager of a bank was a very, very prestigious position. Very. Today it's just a, you know it's just like a managerial position, right? But uh, you know, okay, it's better than being a teller, that's for sure, and it's certainly better than being on the other side of the glass altogether. But Nevertheless, it's, it's not, you know, but in those days it was, it was considered to be, you know, you were like semi-aristocracy, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he was once, in the summer, he was at a spa. <coughs> he was very, very assimilated. He didn't, uh, he, he didn't, nobody knew that he was Jewish. And he's at a spa and somebody drowned and the body was washed in from the lake. There was an enormous lake over there and the body was washed up and had no identifying signs on it whatsoever except for the fact that he was wearing tzitzis. So the people realized over there that this must be a Jew. So they called. There was no Hevra Kadisha, there was no it's burial it's society. Huh? He in water. Obviously he'd fallen in and oh, drowned, well, right? Well, 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 well. <coughs> and he, uh, and he um, so what happened? They called to the, the next town, wherever there was a burial, Jewish burial society, they called for them to come and take the body away and to bury him. So this fellow starts thinking to himself. He says to himself, you know, if I were to die, absolutely nobody would know that I was Jewish. <laughs> So what would happen to me? Let's say my body was washed up. What would happen? They would bury me in the pauper section of the local church. He says, I don't want that. So then he thinks to himself, you know what? I've got the, I've got the most incredible idea. You know what? It's something, I don't have to change the way that I live and I don't have to change the way that I look. I'll just start wearing tzitzis, that's all. No one will see, no one will know. But of course, once you start wearing tzitzis, even if you're wearing them for the right reason, right? He wants to prove that he's Jewish. So slowly but surely, it turned him into a believing Jew. It's Hashem. Everyone should have a wonderful Shabbos. And we'll meet up again on Sunday.